sounds it's complicated until you learn the few steps to it and then it's like click for me it kind of clicked I was like oh okay this makes sense and once it made sense to me it became one of my top two issues or I don't know what two but one of my top issues like political issues because until gerrymandering ends and money we get money out of politics none of the things that I feel really passionately about are going to shift in government at least so that's one of the reasons why I got decided to get more involved so anyways we're going to talk about nonpartisan redistricting and why it matters and I just put this in here because I feel like maybe like the three top words you kind of see around this issue and it can get a little confusing. It's like, wait, is it gerrymandering or nonpartisan redistricting or like what's fair maps? It's a little confusing. So I'm going to go through those words real quick just to explain it. And before I do, I'll give some basics of, of like what we're talking about when we say district maps. So every 10 years we have a census. Um, that's in the whole country. Um, and after the, after the census, every 10 years, each state has to redraw their congressional and legislative district maps based on population, based, mostly based on population. Um, and the purpose is to make sure that the districts are having fairly even populations because, you know, over 10 years, things can shift, people move, cities and towns change. Um, so that's just kind of, and um, each district then sends a representative or a senator to the state government. And then that's for the legislative districts and for the congressional districts. That's where we send people to represent us um, at the federal level. So gerrymandering is in the basic sense, a way to include or exclude certain voters in a congressional or a legislative district to maintain power. And nonpartisan redistricting is kind of the opposite of that. It's a way of drawing district maps in a nonpartisan way that uses concepts like keeping districts compact. So they're not just like meandering in weird shapes, um, using geography, maybe municipal lines or communities of interest. Um, and I'll just really briefly go over community of interest is a community of interest could be municipal lines, like using county. A county could be a community of interest. Um, it could also be a cultural group or maybe a group of people that work in a specific industry. It could be a watershed, like people that live around a specific watershed. It could be a really interesting example that I heard was <clears throat> in the foothills of LA. There, which, so it's like, farther out of the city, but they were still a part of districts that were included in the city. And in the foothills, they were much more likely to get wildfire issues. But because they were kind of divided up so that there are many different districts that included the people who were affected by wildfires, nobody really paid attention to them and they weren't really being represented with their issue. And so they asked to have their own district made that just included people in the foothills so that they could have somebody representing them who is actually gonna pay really close attention to wildfires so they could be represented that way. So it could really be any group um, that has a common interest that they need representation for. And so those are some ways that people will draw district maps so that people are represented fairly. Hopefully that made sense. You can ask me questions later if it didn't. <laughs> Um, and fair maps is just kind of a catchphrase for nonpartisan redistricting. We just want fair maps, <laughs> which is kind of the same thing as nonpartisan. One way to explain how people gerrymander the districts, they call it packing and cracking. And I thought it'd be helpful to maybe show this short video just because I explained it really well. Partisan redistricting, or gerrymandering, is about fractions, percentages. These coins represent voters in an evenly divided state, 50 dimes, 50 pennies. They elect 10 representatives. That means each district map must contain 10 coins. Of course, real people don't live in neat rows, so let's mix them up. 
This is our hypothetical state. Let's see what happens if the dimes draw the maps. 10 coins in each district. So first thing we do is pack the pennies, give them two, two safe districts, but pack them solid. The remaining eight districts are won by the dimes, by smaller but still comfortable margins. The dimes win eight districts and the pennies win two. The dimes overwhelmingly control the legislature. Of course, if the pennies drew the district lines, the opposite could happen. Let's rig it for the pennies. For the pennies, we pack the dimes into two safe districts and crack the remaining eight districts and win by the same margin, eight to two. Well, now that we've destroyed democracy, let's consider how this would look if the maps were drawn based on compactness and keeping communities of interest together. You get evenly divided districts in an evenly divided state. There are some that go heavily dime, there are some that go penny, but that's to be expected. People live where they live, and that's what democracy is about. It's not about party bosses rigging elections for them. All right. I'll just say it again, it's, it's, if we were gonna use our present day example in Wisconsin, the majority party right now is Republicans. It's been other ways in other states throughout history, Democrats and Republicans have both done this. But right now in Wisconsin, the Republicans are in power. They have the majority. And so when they drew the maps in 2011, they were able to pack Democrats into certain districts called safe districts where they knew that they would, the Democrats would win those districts. And then once they had packed them into as few districts as possible, they separated the rest of them out into all the districts so that they would have a little bit in each district, but the Republicans would win. So that's kind of what that um, video was explaining. Um, um, one question is, why are the maps, I, I don't know if you all have heard much of this, but from what I've learned, the 2000, the maps that were drawn in 2011 in Wisconsin were like the worst gerrymandered maps in history. So it's like, why, why, what changed? Um, one thing that shifted was one party, which at that point it was Republicans had majority in every body of government in Wisconsin, the government, the governor, was Republican, the Assembly, the Senate were all Republican majority. And so they were able to gerrymander even more heavily, I guess, because there was no um, nobody going against that, voting against that in a big way. The other thing was for the first time, we just had really advanced computer analytics. Um, which we had never really had access to before. And so in 2011, they hired a computer analyst from Oklahoma to draw their maps using past voter data, which had never really been done that way before. They created, I think like 10 different maps and kind of looked at all of them and figured, okay, if people vote this way or that way, which map can we choose where they basically will not be able to win any of the districts? the to, to the democrats um and they chose that map <laughs> and so incumbents virtually cannot lose um with the maps that they chose um i really have no, i really have no idea how patty shatner even got elected in in the, her district that was kind of a miracle i think because they really heavily gerrymandered them and um the maps were actually drawn in secret in 2011 with this um, computer analyst and the representatives and senators. So they drew these secret maps. They had like the Republican representatives and senators come look at their district map, but they would only let them see their district. They wouldn't even let them see the whole map. So they didn't even really know what what they were voting on. And there's like, there's this man named Dale Schultz. He used to, I think he was a Senator. Um, and he voted on these maps, he's Republican. 
And he voted yes. And then after the fact, when he saw how heavily gerrymandered the maps were, he was super against it. And he's like, I didn't even know what I was voting for. Um, so it was just a really messed up um, process that they did in 2011. And since then, the US Supreme Court has voted that the Wisconsin maps are unconstitutional, but they decided to leave it up to Wisconsin to fix the problem. They're not gonna make them do anything, which I think was a poor choice, but they are unconstitutional. Now that we know what gerrymandering is, here are some of the impacts. Um, that legislators are unaccountable to their constituents. And this happens because when, when you draw maps so that most of the incumbents basically cannot lose, their job is secured for 10 years um, after those maps are drawn. So they're gonna win their election pretty much no matter what every time in those 10 years. So they can basically do whatever they want or not do things and they're not going to lose their jobs. So they don't have to listen to anybody, even people, even their constituents in their own party, they don't have to listen to. The Another thing is it decreases competition in races. And just simply for the fact of if you know you're pretty much have no chance of winning your election, why would you even run? <laughs> it, it's so much energy and time and money. So um, I don't remember, I didn't write down that the statistic, but in, in the year after 2011, there's been so many um, races where people haven't even run against the incumbents. And that's not really healthy for democracy. We need competition in order for people, you know, we really want the best person for the job in office. So we want, we want competition. Um, another thing is it deprives Wisconsinites of equal representation. And one way to explain that is in 2020, the presidential vote in Wisconsin was won by 63%. And we know that Wisconsin is a swing state. It can shift a little bit each way. But in, two, in 2020, um, the Republicans still have the majority. Um, they retain control of 60% of both the state Senate and assembly seats, which doesn't really make sense if about 50% of people went for each party, it shouldn't be, you know, if, if it's about 50%, you would think there'd be about 50% of Republicans and Democrats in the Senate and Assembly, but um, because it's so heavily gerrymandered, it doesn't, it doesn't shift back and forth according to how people are voting from election to election. Um, another reason, another impact of gerrymandering is it's just super expensive. Um, Wisconsin spent over $4 million on court cases defending the gerrymandered maps since 2011. And it's like, we could be fixing roads, we could be funding education, we could be doing really great stuff with $4 million um, instead of defending maps that are unfair. Um, and another impact is it, it leads to even more extreme partisanship. Um, there's not much working across the aisle because they know they're not gonna lose their job. They don't really have to. And if they're in the majority, they can kind of do what they want. Um, and another, another issue that I've been learning about a little bit more is like, so right now the Republicans are in majority and it seems like the people who are kind of higher up in the Republican party in Wisconsin are kind of telling the whole party, you know, you should really be doing this thing, you should be doing that thing. And if you don't, we're not going to fund your next election. Like we'll have a different Republican run against you. So they kind of have this issue where they feel like if they don't go along with the party, what the rest of the party wants, that they're not going to be elected the next time. And so that leads to even more extreme partisanship because they don't even feel like they can go against anything that the the party, the people in power in the party are wanting to push forward. Um, this is a graphic that just shows that legislators aren't accountable to their constituents. Um, I'll just maybe read one of them. 75% um, of Wisconsinites 
support expanding special special education funding as voted down. That doesn't make sense. If if we know that 75% of voters want that, the legislators should be listening to that. And we just keep seeing that over and over again. Um, I don't know if any of you all ended up watching that free, that free um, screening of the documentary, Can You Hear Me Now? Or I actually think it's actually, Can You Hear Us Now? Um, but one, one thing that they said, I remember that, so that documentary was specifically about gerrymandering in Wisconsin and some people who um, tried to run against incumbents, but you're able to get like public records of who has contact, contacted their legislators about specific issues. And this woman in the video, I don't remember the numbers, but she got records of how many people contacted their legislators about wanting the state parks to be funded. It was like a crazy high number and there was hardly anybody or maybe zero people who contacted their legislators asking for the state parks to be defunded and they defunded the parks. Like nobody wanted that. <laughs> they just did it anyways. Right? Um, so just one example. Um, this is kind of, an example showing how the districts in Wisconsin don't make sense. Like, okay, so the population of Dunn County, I don't know if I can really, you can see exactly the boundaries are kind of hard to see. Um, but if we look at Dunn County, there's four different districts, um, assembly districts in Dunn County, but we know that an average in each assembly district they have about 57,000 um, residents in that district. There's less people, there's, the population of Dunn County is less than that amount. So you could easily have Dunn County be in one assembly district, but they've split it up because they know that, especially in Menominee, they tend to vote a certain way. And so they've kind of split them up strategically, but also just makes it really confusing. Like I know some, some people who have kids that go to schools in Menominee and their school district is split up in two different districts. It's just confusing when you're trying to get your representatives to listen to issues that are important to you, but you have to like contact two different people, sometimes three, you know, or four, depending on the Senate districts. And it's just really confusing. It doesn't make sense. It's not conducive for people participating in democracy. And there's a lot of other examples like that in Wisconsin. Polk County, I haven't heard anybody say too much about how the lines are done in Polk County, except I've heard, I actually emailed, anyways, I've heard some people say that they gerrymandered some small townships out of the western part of Polk County and in the southern part too. And they don't really like how they're drawn, but I don't, I don't know if he, as huge of an issue as this, although Polk County does have, I think, at least two different assembly and Senate districts, which is probably unnecessary. So one, one strategy that um, people have been using in Wisconsin to kind of get the momentum going, getting more people knowing about this issue is passing referendums and resolutions across the state. So um, you can look at this map. And we're on it now, which is exciting. We have a resolution passed, um, which means that the county board recommended to the state that they use a nonpartisan procedure for drawing the maps. And then the referendum, which is gonna be in the ballot on April 6th, is giving the voters a chance to weigh in on that. And so most counties in the state have either passed a resolution or a referendum or both. Um, so it just shows we, we want fair maps. Um, and yeah, this April, Ashland, Buffalo, Polk, and Richland counties are all um, have a referendum on the ballot. And this is just another poll showing that when people were asked, who do you want to draw the maps? Most people said they want a nonpartisan commission. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how is gerrymandering connected to racism. And so there's this political gerrymandering, which is most what a lot of people are talking about, but there's also racial gerrymandering. Um, 
and it can sometimes kind of be the same thing, but de depending on party affiliation and stuff like that. But so we talked about packing and cracking earlier. Um, and right now it's it's used as a tactic against non-white voters in some areas, which is illegal. Um, but originally packing gave communities of color an advantage when they kind of started doing it. Now it exploits them. So, um, and again, I'll just say when they pack, when they, for example, are packing non-white voters into a district, it means they're kind of lumping all of those voters into one district. And when they're using it in an exploitive way, it's kind of to pre prevent them from, have, from having representation in a majority white district, or they can divide the non-white voters into many different districts to dilute their voice. That would be cracking, but the pra practice of packing was originally encouraged in 1965 with the Supreme Court's decision on the Voting Rights Act. And the hope was that, especially in the South, Black folks would not be divided into many other districts, kind of what I was saying, like cracking, that's the concept, um, but to be kept together and be more likely to get the representation that they deserve. And that's kind of like now people are calling that like a community of interest, a cultural group could be considered a community of interest. But this practice has kind of been exploited and is now used as a reason to like justify racial gerrymandering because they say, oh, well, we have to keep them together. But it can, it's a little confusing, but it can be used. I'll show you a picture of one of the racial gerrymandering maps um, districts and it'll, it'll show a little bit better, but it, it can be pretty ex, ex negative too. Um, before I show you that, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about one big example that I've learned about with um, gerrymandering and how it's negatively impacted um, communities of color is the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. Um, because of the way that they gerrymandered the districts in Michigan, giving the majority party an unfair advantage. Um, the governor of Michigan was able to appoint, they call them emergency managers to take over the city business in, Flint in order to cut costs. And because they were saying that they were gonna have a financial crisis, so they had to save them from the financial crisis. And the, the residents got to vote on whether or not they ha would have this um, emergency manager kind of work. I, I don't actually, I'm not positive that they voted on whether to have an emergency manager or whether they were voting on the water issue. I think they were voting on whether to have an emergency manager, but um, the people voted against it but they overturned the decision and then appointed, yeah, I think it was, I think they were voting on whether or not to have an emergency manager. So they overturned the law that, or they overturned what the people voted on and they appointed the emergency manager of Flint who then went on to change their water supply in order to save money um, and didn't, it seems like he, didn't really have the interest of the people in mind when he was doing this, he was just trying to save money. And he continually denied that the water was unsafe even after many people developed lead poisoning and numerous studies came out saying that the water was unsafe. Um, so it's just kind of one example. It's like if, if the districts are gerrymandered and one party has an unfair advantage and more power, even if the people vote on something, they can just do the opposite thing. Um, which was really destructive, harmed a lot of people, and it wasn't fair. Um, this is an example of some racial gerrymandering in South Carolina, I mean, sorry, North Carolina. Um, and so, like, especially, the, like, the, the congressional district, uh, it's, like, outrageous. <laughs> That's the one on the left, the orange one. And they were specifically like putting all of, I'm pretty sure it was a majority black population 
keeping them in one district, but it's like this windy thing and it it was to exclude them from having a voice in in politics. And it was deemed in 2017 also unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. So those are just a few things I know about racial gerrymandering, but um, I, I think I've told some of you about this already, but there's this really cool documentary called Slay the Dragon, and they took a, talk a lot more about racial gerrymandering in that documentary. If you want to learn more about that. Um, so what's happening now in Wisconsin, the <clears throat> Governor Evers created a nonpartisan commission um, called the People's Maps Commission um, in order to draw maps for the legislature to consider. So they would draw the congressional, state, senate, and assembly maps. And they've been um, having virtual hearings all around the state to hear what's important to people to um, include when they're drawing the maps, um, trying to make them fair, nonpartisan, and um, just develop a transparent process for how to do this. Um, a lot of people, I don't know if some of you have heard people talk about the Iowa model. Iowa's had a nonpartisan way of doing this for over 40 years, but it's not necessarily that part of the People's Maps Commission is they get to decide what kind of process will make the most sense for Wisconsin. We have much more diverse, from what I understand, a much more diverse population than Iowa. And so it's a lot more important to consider cultural groups and things like that when we draw our maps. Um, and if you feel like really strongly about something you would want to be included in our maps around here, you can submit um, public comment on their website. And this kind of just shows the process of what will happen this year. The People's Maps Commission is going to be putting together their maps and it'll be finalized after we get the census numbers in. The legislature is probably also going to try to get their maps that we have right now passed. And the governor will probably veto the legislature's maps. Well, I, I guess first the legislature will probably vote down the People's Maps Commission map, then the leg legislature will put their maps before the governor and he'll probably veto that and then it will go to the courts. So if if so that's kind of like the one of the major tactics is just getting the most people talking about this issue because if I guess kind of what happens seems to happen in court cases is if the majority of people are for a particular issue, the courts are a lot more likely to vote to um, decide in that in their favor. So that's kind of kind of the timeline. Now the court case will probably happen. I don't know in the fall or winter or something. Um, and then they're also trying to pass legislation through the state level so that we have to have a nonpartisan process. Um, and then I don't know if any of you have heard about HR1, which is called for the People's Act, for the People Act, which has been in the news a lot. And this is kind of a federal, it's about a lot of different voting and voting rights issues, um, but gerrymandering is in there, but it's only for congressional districts. So if this was passed, it would definitely be helpful, but we still have to pass something at the state level if we wanna change how legislative districts are passed. Um, and I believe it's passed in the US, US House, um, but they're still awaiting action in the Senate. And so once you know about it, I don't know if you feel like I do, like this is really messed up, it shouldn't be this way. There's lots of things we can do about it. We can contact our legislators if we want to be more impactful with it, just because we know that legislators tend to not listen to us. <laughs> um, there's a group, there's people all over the state that are kind of trying to put together a strategy to make contacting the legislators more impactful. I know in Western Wisconsin, there's a group that I'm organizing with that are trying to make up a strategic plan so if you wanted to be a part of that, you could let me know. 
You could submit public comment to the People's Maps Commission. You can get out the word about the April 6th referendum. Um, there's a few more, there's gonna be a few more sign rallies around the county. You can write a letter to the editor if you want to. I'd be happy to help with that. Um, I still have lots of yard signs and we're gonna have some phone banking dates um, the next two Tuesday evenings and Saturday mornings. And another great thing is just share what you know about nonpartisan redistricting with like even just three people could make a difference. So that's all I got. Um, hopefully it wasn't too technical. It's kind of confusing, but I don't know. Yeah, there it is. So if you have any questions, you can ask away.